I think we are live. Okay, I am so sorry to everybody who was waiting for us at um, half past the hour, but we've been, <laughs> we are now on our third browser to get this thing to work. Um, it worked really well when I did a sample the other day with someone, so I don't know, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm blaming the Australians. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, um, I'm Mitzi Soretto, and this is going to be my first broadcast with one of my contributors from the best new true crime stories, Serial Killers. So if you don't know about this book, you need to know about it. Uh, I'm, in, I'm joined today by Anthony Ferguson, who is coming to us live from Western Australia. Hello, Anthony. Good day. Hey, good day. I had to do that, you know. <laughs> Sorry, I couldn't resist. Listen, I was actually plotting to to play a couple of bars from, uh, uh, you know, the 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 Men at Work song. <laughs> you know, I come from the land. Down. I thought that would be overkill, and I also thought I might be copyright violation if I tried that. So I didn't want to push it. <laughs> so, any, anyways, um, tell us how how are you doing this fine Australian morning? Yeah, we're pretty good over here. The um. The, the CV situation is not too bad here at the moment, and we're all kind of socially distancing. Uh, so um, it, it's okay. It's early in the morning here. Yeah, well, you have enough loo roll? <laughs> yeah, yeah, just by chance. I didn't panic by, but um, we, we have got plenty, yeah. We can survive the apocalypse. <laughs> I may ask you to ship me some if I run out. I've I've sort of been avoiding the, the stores and I heard there isn't any anyway. You see, this is what we should have invested stock in, you know? Yeah. Bought stock in all the Lou Roll companies. So uh, anyways, uh, just to mention to everyone, uh, Anthony's story is called Australia's Brownout Murders. Um, why don't you set the stage a little bit for those people who don't know, what is a brownout? Okay, a brownout was, um, this happened during the Second World War. Uh, a brownout is a softer version of the blackout that they had in uh, Europe and London and there's uh, certain places where every everything was out. A brownout was a softer version, so it just meant lights dimmed after, I think it was about 7 p.m. Um, everybody had to uh, put um, paper and stuff over their windows because they could have the lights on inside. So just in case we were bombed, because we only really got bombed, uh, Darwin in the north got bombed by the Japanese. But this happened in like big cities like Melbourne, where our crime is set, and Sydney, say. Uh, but of course, we never got bombed in the end. Oh, well, that, so that's, that's, a, that's at least good. <laughs> no, <laughs> so instead you ended up with a serial killer, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, which is worse? I don't know. I don't know. Um, so tell us a little bit about your subject that you chose to write about. Um, I mean, he's a little bit unusual because it's an Australian serial killer story, but he's not an Australian, is he? No, Eddie Leonsky was an um, American from New York that was uh, shipped out here with with um, several hundred, several thousand other um, American GIs to to um, to assist in the war effort in in Melbourne. Uh, you'll find a lot of Australian serial killers are actually immigrants. Uh, they're um, they're uh, often English. Uh, what happens is like psychopathy is just universal, of course, and the problems you have in the, the old world, you're going to have again in the new world. So that's what happened here. We had, we've got some great serial We had some great serial killers. Uh, the, the granny killer, he was English. Um, the backpacker Charming. <laughs> The backpacker slayer Ivan Milat was uh, sort of, you know, Yugoslav, Croatian, I believe. Um, the the mutilator in the 50s was also an English immigrant, and Eddie was an American GI. Well, there you go. We've sort of. Well, I'll be honest with you. When I when I was doing this book, um, I actually had to sort of say, okay, I've got enough. English serial killers, British serial killers, I've, I've got to put in some others. You know, everyone assumes that serial killers are all American. And yes, uh, the Americans do hold the number one slot for serial killers. Um, I don't know if it's, we do, there's a big population in America, but I, 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 you know, I think that's a whole sociological study about why we produce so many serial killers in America. I mean, Britain's a small island and they seem to have a, a wee too many over there as well. So. So, uh, so good old Eddie decided to help out the Aussies and kill a few people along the way. Then he did. He did. Yeah. <laughs> um, tell us a little bit about him. Uh, I mean, uh, as far as um, 
a little bit without giving too much away from this of of the story because obviously we want people to buy the book and read about these people but um tell just give us a little overview about uh what his modus operandi was uh, who he was targeting yes yeah um Eddie was a bit of a mummy's boy, but he, he was a huge man. He was very muscular. He, when he grew up, he was uh, quite introverted. But um, he built himself up powerfully so he could show off his physical capacities. And obviously, he was a great candidate to, uh, to join the armed forces. Um, as I say, he, he was very homesick. He was lonely. Uh, he also had a terrible problem with alcohol. And when he drank, he would exhibit, uh, he would show off like that with his way of like, reaching out to the world. He would show off his, his immense strength and a lot of his colleagues were quite terrified of him because of his strength. Uh, sorry, his modus, modus operandum was he targeted older women because he really he was a mummy's boy, he missed his mother. And he, he actually had that, uh, that Freudian, uh, as I say, mother or dichotomy. He wanted every woman to be the romantic ideal and perfect like his mum. And when they weren't, when they were fl flirtatious and they accepted his advances, he, he got angry and violent, or uh, well, he was a psychopath. His, motive, his MO was to approach women in bars or on quiet streets and um, chat them up, and uh, he would strangle them in a fit of, uh, fit of rage. Charming. Uh, now, if I'm correct, uh, were, were all of these, were these uh, single women, or were some of these women maybe just sort of out looking for a bit of fun during wartime? Yeah, I think one was a 31-year-old 30, married lady whose husband had been stationed away and she was a singer in a bar. And, and she, from, from all accounts, she was, you know, vivacious and flirtatious. But the other two were just um, older women that are, say, a dec decade older than this in their mid-40s who were just, like, on the street waiting for a bus and he saw them, he'd been drinking and he approached them and offered to, to you know, walk with them for a bit or chat to them. So there were three victims and all. There were several others before that that he didn't quite get to kill because he was interrupted. So you know, actually, that, that's interesting because it's not like he was targeting a specific woman, sort of like, you know, um, if you're an innocent woman, I'll, you know, that's fine. But if you return my flirtation and sexual advances, then I kill you, right? So it's, a, I mean, waiting for a bus, this obviously is completely different from somebody that maybe he was flirting with in a bar and returned his attentions. It's yes. just so random. Yeah, he's an opportunist, an opportunistic serial killer, yeah. He didn't stalk people for like, you know, days, weeks on end and then closing on them. It was just random by chance. And of course, those, those circumstances would have, you know, made, made, made life very different. I mean, it was dark all the time there was the brownout it was wartime so like everybody was probably a bit mentally out of, out of sync like like we are to a lesser extent now with all this this isolation oh, oh so are you thinking we're maybe going to have a whole bunch of serial killers coming out of this COVID-19 epidemic oh not at all no we actually haven't had any serial killers in Australia since the turn of the 21st century Oh, right. Well, do you want to kind of give us a little PS about why that might be? Yeah, I do have my own theories. Um, I think that the technology has improved a lot. Um, there's there's better DNA tech. There's more surveillance, like we're, we're being observed and watched all the time. And where do serial killers operate? They operate in crowded places where they can they can, um, they can can pick out a victim. And, you know, we have cameras on the screen and at, at bars and clubs everywhere these days. So I think it's hard. And we've got one in Perth right now uh, on trial, the, the Claremont serial killer. And he actually stopped killing in 1997. So he's like, uh, you know, maybe in his late 50s now. He must have thought he got away with it. But there was some new DNA technology that picked him up on some DNA on an item of clothing. And apparently they've been watching him for a little while anyway, but this nailed him. Uh, he hasn't confessed. He's in the courts. The trial's going on for ages at the moment, and it's closed, closed court. Um, but, geez, that guy must have thought he got away with it. And I'm assuming it's him. I'm pretty certain it's him. And there'll be a hundred books on it when it, when it, when it comes out. Yeah, <laughs> no doubt, no doubt. Mm -hmm. It's interesting if he's not confessed because serial killers mm -hmm. do tend to be rather egotistical and they do like to brag about their crimes. There is, and there's probably nothing, I, don't, I guess there's nothing in it for him to confess. So he's just playing it out as long as he can, I guess. Yeah, yeah, kind of his 15 minutes of fame, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs>
Um, so tell me, um, what what actually um, inspired you to pick Eddie Leonsky as your subject? I mean, out of all the serial killers, including the infamous granny one. <laughs> oh, okay. It was actually when I saw your uh, call out for um, submissions, I, I wanted to do one that was, uh, it was quite interesting that it might appeal to your specific readership. But I have actually, as, as you know personally, I have a, a book out on Australian serial killers, and I have covered pretty much all of them. And what I did was I um, adapted the chapter I was drafting for you, and um, we cut it a little bit. So yeah, I thought that was quite that was one of the more interesting cases. Yeah, and well, I mean, as an American, it might have been to you. Well, yeah, exactly, exactly. Especially someone who was brought over from the United States to help out during the war effort in Australia, and it's uh, mm. I don't know, it's a bit of a slap in the face. You know? It is. Well, did you know that? Um, we, from the chapter that there was a the, the American authorities and the uh, Australian authorities had a huge clash and it was uh, the Americans wanted to execute him because they were embarrassed by him, executing him immediately but under Australian law I don't think he would have been executed immediately he probably would have been put in prison and the Americans did not want that and they they managed to force the hand of the Australian authorities and it was the very first time that that a, um, a foreign citizen was tried uh, under foreign law in Australia, and uh, yeah. he was, yeah, he was, it was the trial was rushed through, and he was executed uh, very quickly. You think yeah. perhaps it was also an embarrassment factor for the United yeah. States? Yeah, yeah, I mean, I would be embarrassed. <laughs> yeah. That's pretty. It's pretty bad. I, out of curiosity, what are your? Do, did you have the death penalty at that time? I think it might have been different in different states. I know in Western Australia, I think the death penalty was lifted in 1963 or 60, 60, 63, I think. 65, I think, was Australia wide. I think there was a thing called Ronald Ryan, was the last one. We haven't had it for a long, long time yet. I know it's very different in the state. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We used to come out the originals, but we don't know. Well, I mean, in, in Melbourne, uh, so was, what, Melbourne is what part of Australia for those who aren't geographically off eh, with the country? It's on the east coast where much of the culture is. I'm on the west coast, which is the most isolated capital city in the world, Perth. Um, so most of the action happens on the east coast. You've got um, Queensland, then you've got New South Wales, then you've got Victoria, and then below that, the island of Tasmania. So Melbourne and Sydney are the sort of the hub of, of uh, culture and society in Australia. We're all dotted around the coast and there's bugger all in the middle. <laughs> <laughs> Lots of bush. <laughs> oh gosh. Uh, um, as far as your story is is concerned on on, on Eddie Leonsky, uh, so what effect did this this case have on Australian society? As far as um, I, I mean, you've referenced in the piece. I just would like you to discuss it a little bit about um, how did people react to the Americans? I mean, uh, first of all, in general, with the Americans coming in during the during the Second World War, what was what was people's attitudes? Um, same as the uh, the British, because we were very much a, a British colony, British society. Uh, the the slogan used was the, the Yanks are. Oversexed, overpaid, overpaid, oversexed, and over here. So there was, there were, there were brawls in the streets between Australian troops and American troops for a while. But you know, it's, it's a love hate relationship. We, we, they got along eventually. Um, they didn't probably didn't appreciate the because the Americans were very suave and charming. They changed Australian society. Australian society was was quite Victorian and moralistic. But um, the combination of, of the, the charming, suave Americans targeting the, um, the uh, single women that were left behind here uh, and um, the, the brown out and the, the change in situations. Uh, like it made Melbourne change almost overnight. Uh, Melbourne discovered uh, sleeves and sly grog shops and illicit sex, even illicit public sex and, in uh, parks and doorways and things like that. Things that we very much suppressed before they changed. And the American brought us culture and music and fashion and all these things and of course long term a great relationship was established between the american authorities and the u.s authorities and which is why that uh, we follow you rather than the british now in, in military terms so so the americans came in and corrupted everybody is that the story <laughs> they, 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 they brought everything that's wonderful about america and everything that's that's dark about american uh, you know capitalism freedom we were capitalist anyway but yeah, we were we were a lot more 
restricted and reserved before. That British reserves was still sort of there. Yeah. You know, the people people would always ask me too about the British Reserve because I was you probably know I lived in Britain for many years and I'm also a British citizen. And I was like, you know, I really didn't notice a lot of British Reserve, you know. <laughs> I don't know what they're you know, maybe that that might have existed back in another generation, but I didn't see an awful lot of it. <laughs> I think it changed in the in the sixties, of course. The, the, yeah. The, the changed in the sixties, yeah. Yeah. I'm yeah. actually English too. I was born in England and moved here in the mid 60s. I didn't know that. What part? Surrey, a town called Leatherhead. Leatherhead, yes. Yeah, so, uh, mm. <laughs> Leatherhead. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that infamous Leatherhead. Mm. I, as far as um the the case itself with Leonsky, uh, how did people react to to this? I mean, to find out that this was somebody who came over from from the United States to help and and was killing their women. I mean, how what was what was the reaction of people in in society and people in Melbourne? I didn't get I didn't get a lot of like great public outrage or outcry from this at all. Um, I, I I don't think people were particularly you know racially challenged by it. They were just happy that the thing was resolved. Um, maybe they were happy it wasn't an Australian, but. You know, Australians can be just as violent. But yeah, there, there was no great, um, you know, social outcry. I, I wonder if that if that would have happened today. Is, you know, we might have slightly different uh, take on that, as we know with in the United States. <laughs> so, but the, yeah, that's interesting because I would have thought that uh, there would have been a bit more objection to it. Although, as you said, they sort of rushed it all through and and sort of put paid to it and it probably helped that it was an ally and that it was a white guy you know if it was someone from us you know certain other cultures and in those days when there was a lot more racism around i'm sure there would have been a huge hue and cry but no i think they were grateful that it, that it was wrapped up and um they, that they could carry on with their drinking and carousing <laughs> back to the sly grog shops eh mm, yeah yeah. Uh, so I'll let you get in a plug. You mentioned earlier that you've uh, actually done a book now that is all on Australian serial killers. Indeed, yes. And it, it's coming out in America with um, Exposit Books, who are a subsidiary of McFarlane Publishers. Um, I haven't got a, a, a date yet, and I've still got to get the, uh, the draft back, the edited draft back to finish off. And we don't have a title. We've got a working title. It's called Fresh Blood. Australian serial killers, especially in regard to the fact that um, a lot of the, the readership we're hoping to get won't be very familiar with Australian serial killers. But they're oh, certainly not well. first, they go back to um, the 1780s. Oh, wow. Oh, so, well, it uh, definitely sounds interesting. Definitely. Mm. I mean, I'll have to check that out. If you want a blurb, you, you can hit me up for one. Okay, we'll, we'll do that. Yeah, I'll, I'll um, <laughs> hopefully get it out late, late, late this year, early next year. But um. Okay. Yeah, yeah, well, we got to keep those printing presses going, COVID-19 or not. We, we got to get the books, you know, get that ink slapped on the page. We have to keep going. People need to read. Absolutely. And it's uh, now that we're all isolated, writing and reading will be one of the, the, uh, the big hobbies we can all rediscover. Yeah, absolutely. Anything that encourages reading. I think maybe this is, you know, a, a one positive amongst the negative is, is get people back into books and discovering the joys of books, fiction, nonfiction, whatever. It's all wonderful. So, uh, so anyways, I do appreciate you coming on. And I'm, I'm, again, I apologize to everyone for us being about half an hour late. I was on my third browser and <laughs> going back and forth with Anthony on Facebook, like, here's another link. This is another invite link. Try this one. I'm like, what, what else already? You know, um, but uh, I'd like to, um, you know, I'm, I'm planning to chat with some other contributors from this book uh, in the next few weeks. And I have another book coming out in the summer, which is the follow up to this, which is the best true, the, the best new true crime stories, small towns. And Anthony is also in that book. So um, perhaps when I get the ball rolling on that, we can chat again and um, hopefully have a little less technical problems. Absolutely. Yeah, we can talk about the, uh, the snow town murders. Tiny town. Yes. That's absolutely sounds like a plan. Well, thank you so much. Uh, thanks everyone for listening and thank you, Anthony, for joining me. Um, absolute pleasure. Anytime. Okay. Bye. Okay. Bye-bye.